Bonjour and welcome to a new virtual tour with Vero. I am on a summer vacation right now, a one week vacation on the Atlantic coast and I haven't been working much this week. But the place where I'm staying is too good not to share and I thought I would take you on a stroll today, a virtual tour. And I hope you enjoy the stories I have to tell because this town named Arcachon, A-R-C-A-C-H-O-N on the Atlantic coast comes with many good stories. You have this incredible view. You are looking now at the bay of Arcachon and across from us is a peninsula known as the Cap Ferré, a renowned place, a lot of uh, French celebrities and uh, some uh, affluent, <laughs> affluent ones have homes, property on the Cap Ferré. You can cross from Arcachon to the Cap Ferré daily on uh, ferries, with ferries. The ride is about 30 minutes. The people who live on the Cap Ferré, that very narrow peninsula there, um, actually overlook the Atlantic Ocean on the other side. But on this side, they face the renowned Bay of Arcachon, uh, well known for its uh, oyster farms, of course, delicious seafood around here. And at my feet here is Arcachon, or at least part of Arcachon. This city, what, about 12,000 people or so, is a very popular uh, seaside resort, um, mostly with French and European tourists, I must say. Most people I see on the street this week um, speak French. And it is divided in four zones and that's quite unusual. The part you are looking at right over the bay of Arcachon right here is known as the summer town. The summer town which is where most people stay where I'm staying because you want to be close to the beach. Uh, the beaches in Arcachon are glorious, uh, beautiful sand beaches, a famous one the Perrer beach and if you went in that direction all the way in that direction, a few miles down, is the tallest sand dune in Europe, known as the Dune du Pila, P-Y-L-A. So we are looking now at the summer town, one of the four parts in Arcachon. They are all named after a season, but this tour today is going to take us through the part known as the winter town. Why would I take you to a place known as the winter town in the middle of July, on a glorious July morning. No, there is no heat wave here. In fact, the temperatures have been great in the 70s all week. But I wanted you to see it from a distance. I wanted you to see the place where we're going to stroll for the next uh, minutes, few minutes. You can see among those trees what's left of uh, the pine trees that used to be here. This was a pine forest here, like a lot of the area, in fact, and there would have been sand dunes all over this. Before those homes were built and other trees were planted, you would have found sand dunes and pine trees. Some of them remain, but a lot of them are gone. So the question is, where am I standing right now? Well, I am standing on uh, one of the local attractions. Some visitors refer to it as the local Eiffel Tower. And that's because it does look like the Eiffel Tower a little bit. I will show it to you from below because I've climbed about 100 stairs to come up here. And uh, I'll now need to, we need to go down those stairs here so we can continue the tour. So I hope you bear with me. It's pretty quiet now because it's early in the morning. It's probably about nine o'clock now. So no, not many people come here, but this is a popular local attraction. So I'm going to go down very carefully. And those, uh, that spiral staircase that you see here is kind of hanging. Uh, those are cables. So it moves when you go up and down. It's very narrow. So if you're afraid of heights, you might want to come back in a <laughs> couple of minutes as I very carefully make my way down this staircase made of cast iron, en fonte, as we say in French. If it weren't for the construction sites, uh, sounds, sorry, next door, 
a home is being restored or remodeled next door, you would probably not hear anything but the birds here. It's so quiet. Making my way down slowly but surely. I thought you'd enjoy coming up there with me. That's why I started the tour on that side. Almost there. Two thirds down now. And you can see the city and the Bay of Arcachon in the distance here, this little hole. I came here early because I wanted to avoid the crowds. They only uh, allow a certain number of people on the stairs at all times. You can see it's very narrow. And so you cannot really pass people on the stairs. Here's the bottom, finally. Thank you for staying with me. All right, now let's look at what we've accomplished. All right, so this is how tight the stairs are. And you can see there are all these cables holding them. So I could feel them move a little bit as I was going down. I'm going to step out so you can see better. All right, so what I refer to as the local Eiffel Tower is actually, actually has no connection whatsoever to uh, Gustave Eiffel, Gustave Eiffel, though you might think it does because of the way it was built. You can see rivets on the structure, among other things. But in fact, this tower was built more than 20 years before the Eiffel Tower was inaugurated in Paris in 1889. In fact, the um, engineer, the architect who designed it, Paul Regnault, was a friend of Gustave Eiffel, who at the time was a young engineer. And they did collaborate on some projects, including in Bordeaux nearby. And, uh, but Gustave Eiffel had nothing to do with this tower, though you may hear otherwise at times. So why did I bring you here, other than to show you the glorious sights? I brought you here to the Wintertown part of Arcachon because this is where the best stories are. Some of the best stories. And let me just say this. If you enjoy, if you enjoy French history, especially during the Belle Epoque, if you like architecture, then you will enjoy coming here to the Wintertown part of Arcachon. Now, Arcachon is only an hour drive from Bordeaux and a lot of people in Bordeaux come here. This is their beach, just like Parisians tend to go to the Normandy coast in Deauville, Trouville, Cabourg, and all those other towns. Well, you have here in Arcachon a place where uh, Bordelais, les Bordelais locals can come and enjoy the beach. This uh, footbridge was built at the same time, at the same time as the tower, which is were, went on. So it's been here a really, really long time. So peaceful in the morning. It's a different picture later in the day, of course. Now, like I said, Today, there are pine trees, but there are also other types of trees. Uh, back in the day, it would have been interesting to see it the way it originally was with uh, sand dunes, essentially. Now, if you'd come here during the Belle Epoque, which as a reminder is the late 19th, early 20th century before uh, World War I, sorry about that. Um, this would have been the way to go up you can see those big rocks here. Um, imagine the ladies of the time who would have come here with their big skirts. Remember the type of skirts or dresses that women wore and they would have gone up this way. But today, fortunately, we can use this. It's a little bit more manageable I've tried both <laughs> and I recommend this way especially to go down. But if you're tempted, you can always go this way to go down. I'll let you be the judge. 
All right, so let's go and explore a little bit more of the story, the history of this winter town that sits way high up above Arcachon, one of four distinct neighborhoods and the one where history lovers tend to, uh, to come. The local tourist office provides tours with uh, licensed tour guides that tell you more about the history and the context of this neighborhood and why it was created which I highly recommend. And they also have uh, very detailed maps and brochures, flyers, where you can find more details about the neighborhood, the winter town, La Ville d'Hiver. So as you leave the area where the tower and footbridge are, you come upon a park, a beautiful park. And at this time of day, it's going to be really quiet. But even as you approach the park, you can tell, at least I could when I arrived the first time three years ago, car coming. <laughs> Merci. You can tell that you are in for a treat because some of the homes immediately catch your eye. This park is known as the Parc Mauresque. So Moresque, Moorish. Where would there be a Parc Moresque inspired with Moorish influences here in Arcachon, in southwestern France on the Atlantic coast? Well, there's a reason for that and we're going to uh, discuss it a little bit. So we'll start here in the park and then I'll show you a few streets of this incredible neighborhood. And I hope you enjoy this stroll, another stroll with Vero. Friends with Vero, you know I have a YouTube channel where more than 200 virtual tours are available for free, of course. This is a big adventure that started in 2020 when the world stopped turning and uh, many people couldn't travel. And I started live streaming from Paris, where I lived at the time, and also from other parts of France where I took viewers as often as I could. And the adventure continues today. I am a tour guide, a virtual tour guide. I teach French in the winter with online French conversation classes. And the rest of the time I publish stories, create stories on social media, weekly, Facebook, Instagram, so if you are interested in France, then join me, France with Vero. And you will get a chance to look at France through the eyes of this French native. Now look at this house over there. This place of the park, this section of the park here, there are many entries, different entrances in this park, is the place where they play pétanque in the afternoons. This is a lively, lively place. In the, during the day. Uh, yesterday there were I don't know how many people playing pétanque. Uh, some of you know boche, boche ball. Well pétanque is typically found in southern France but not just. So people sit here, other people play. It's a very fun part of the park. Now you can see this is a an English style park we shall call it, where nature looks like it's running the show. Here is one of the incredible pine trees you still find around here, but it helps understand what the winter town, La Ville d'Hiver, would have looked like back in the 19th century and before that, of course. There is a section known as La Roseraie, where, as you might guess, they grow roses. So of course in July now we're a little bit past rose season, but there's still a few left. A peaceful start of the day. Of course you have your kiosque à musique, your gazebo, where people would meet for special events, maybe for some music. 
many French parks have a gazebo, un kiosque à musique. This one is no exception. On the left here is a monument dedicated to uh, local sons who perished during uh, World War II and were members of the French Resistance in some cases. I'll show you one more section and then we will head on to the side streets so I can show you why this is such a special neighborhood. Now, palm trees are not native to this region. At one point in time, they were imported. Let's take a peek at this pond here. Romantic little pond. This is an arboretum, this park today. It's been turned into an arboretum. And a lot of the trees, most of the trees have tags. And uh, some of them are quite rare. They tell us not to throw anything, ne rien jeter dans les bassins. So we can't throw anything because there's goldfish in there. Pretty little bridge. An incredible landscaping. All right, so you've seen parts of the Parc Mauresque with its winding alleyways but I'd like you to picture this park at the end of the 19th century and in fact to do this I have brought a postcard for you where that uh, tent is over there used to be an incredible building it was known as the casino le casino mauresque again the word mauresque moorish you can see the influences on this building why would there be a casino right here in the middle of the park on a, in a harder to reach area of the town, right above the Bassin d'Arcachon? This casino, incidentally, you cannot see today except in the shape of a model that sits behind that tent over there. It was destroyed by fire in 1977 and was never rebuilt. But it's still nice to remember that it was here once and now has come the time to tell you a little bit more about the story of Arcachon. Arcachon was just a blip on the local map. It wasn't even a town until the Second Empire, a name you're familiar with if you visit Paris often, Napoleon III, the nephew of Napoleon I, who, with the help of a man named Baron Haussmann, modernized Paris in the second half of the 19th century and turned Paris into a big modern city that could compete with London. Well, as it turns out, it pays off to uh, leave Paris once in a while and to see what other things Napoleon III did. He arguably was not a military genius like his uncle, yet he did a lot to promote France. You might say, to promote French, French tourism even, because the areas he discovered with his wife, Empress Eugenia, became hot spots in France for the French uh, and the European elites as well. On the coast, places in Normandy, for example, the seaside resorts we know today, Deauville, Cabourg, on the southwestern part of the Atlantic coast, Biarritz, Arcachon here. And in the Alps, places like Chamonix, where he stayed, he invested, developing infrastructure, attracting, like I said, the affluent classes, the elite. This is a spectacular pine tree, just gorgeous. But the trees, is not why we're here. I'm going to take you on a little stroll to show you some of the incredible real estate in this area. I haven't seen many neighborhoods like this in France so well preserved. The reason this looks so good is because this entire neighborhood was actually saved. 
in the 1980s. It was pretty run down by that time, but all these homes have been restored to their former glory. Some of them are owned by families, others by are, have been turned into condos split up by among several apartments, for example. Look at this incredible one here. So very often they come with a name and a plaque. They have a name printed on them and a plaque tells you the story of the home. This one is called Teresa, La Villa Teresa. And if you read all the stories, it was saved in 1980. This one was originally built in 1882. And that's a little bit getting ahead of ourselves. We need to talk about what happened right before that. But you can see that the architectural style is quite unusual and spectacular, drawing on different influences, architectural influences, and definitely um, Spanish, Moorish, and other styles of architecture that were really popular in the 19th century. Some of these homes look quite different, and there's a reason for that. Back to Napoleon III and Baron Haussmann. They were two, two brothers, uh, the Perer brothers, Emile and Isaac. They were born in Bordeaux. They were financiers, you might say bankers, and today we would definitely call them entrepreneurs. When the railroad appeared in the mid 19th century, the Perer brothers were on it immediately. Main, um, they were some major shareholders uh, in one of the big ones that went to southern France. And at that time, the train went from Bordeaux to a nearby town. Arcachon did not really exist. But the Perer brothers invested. They were friends of Baron Haussmann, Napoleon III, and they knew Napoleon III had plans for this area, so they were in on the secret, you might say. They bought land here early on and they extended this railroad line all the way to Arcachon. In fact, by 1857, Napoleon III, with an imperial decree, had created the town. So Arcachon became an official town. And then the Perer brothers, who had invested in the area, didn't stop there. They turned the top of this sand dune, this sand dune essentially, hard to picture today, I know, into a place where an affluent clientele could come and r relax, rest. At the time, tuberculosis was a major disease in Europe, all over the world, in fact, and there was no known cure for it. But people hoped that if they spent time breathing the clean scent of pine trees or by the seashore, then something could be done to alleviate the symptoms of tuberculosis. They created a town from scratch on a sand dune with original homes. We have almost 300 of those homes on this hill today. But at the time, there were just a handful of them and they designed them in a style known as the chalet. <laughs> so if you picture a Swiss chalet in the mountains, they were like big chalets. And you might say they were very strict covenants, the height of the fences, the color of the walls, but already um, an architectural style was emerging, the mix of the limestone and the red brick. Some of them had colors on the facades as well. The reason was they promoted Arcachon, the winter town, as a winter destination. In the summer, people could go to the beach, it was easy. But in the winter, they wanted them to come here. Well, those people, those patients who had tuberculosis traveled with their entourage, their families, their friends, and they needed places to stay. So what the Pereira brothers did was they didn't, be, they didn't bring a, they didn't build a solarium or a facility, a hospital, no. They created a town with those chalets where those patients would come with their entire families, typically three floors, so those homes were really spacious. And, and they would have services available to them. Doctors and nurses would come to them throughout the week when needed. They could hire servants as well. 
Now, of course, the other members of the family, their entourage, needed to be kept busy. And this is why you have this, you had for a while, this incredible casino. Casino, performances, areas for children, entertainment, just as you would find today in many resorts, really. And this is why all of that was brought up here to the winter town, the highest part of Arcachon. Now you can see this house, which is named Sigur. There's a name right there on that facade. It needs a little bit of work, but this is a quite representative of some of the homes here. A lot of them had belvedere's and very high towers. Often the towers would have staircases, but the belvedere's would be uh, to maximize the views on the bay, the Bay of Arcachon, which is right behind me here. So this house is incredible. It does need some work. You can see some beautiful windows here with stained glass. Now, if you buy one of these homes today, you have to be aware that uh, restorations can only be done in a certain way because the chief architect of the French monuments would keep a close eye on what happens to these old ladies that have been turned into historic monuments of France. At any rate, the Perrer brothers were very successful and in the 1860s, 1870s, those homes were built and the European elites would come here, came here to try and feel better, breathe the good air. And the reason you have so many winding streets, it's, let's picture it as the top of this hill is like a, a dédale de rue, a maze of streets. It's incredible because you can get lost in those streets, but you'll never be sorry you did because you will see through gates and fences some pretty incredible homes. This one is called Les Marronniers, the chestnut trees. So of course, some of them have been updated when possible, but most of them retain the architectural features of that time. In fact, there were three generations of those homes because after the first generations of the chalets, the Perrer brothers brought in, uh, <clears throat> other people started buying lots here and continued building homes, but in more creative styles. And that was during the Belle Epoque before World War I. So some of them had Art Nouveau features as you have been known to see them. Look at this one. So this one, actually has some very interesting features. And that was very typical of this area. The patients would never really leave the house. They were too weak and too sick to leave the house. So they had balconies up there where a patient could lie down on a lounge chair. And you can see how the rooftop projects itself to protect the person standing on that uh, balcony here. You can also see the intricate wood carving that's very uh, typical of the style of a lot of these homes that were added from the 1860s through the 1870s. So like I said, future generations or next, the following generation of homes had more, let's say, creativity and uh, had a nickname. They called them the Fofols, Fofol, which doesn't mean they were crazy. It just meant that they were in relation to the Folies, you may have heard this name, Folie, those uh, fancy country homes that uh, the French elite built for themselves outside big cities, in particular in Paris. And then finally, something happened. And before World War II, a third generation of homes were built, but much, much more modest, humble than the previous ones. In fact, they would have been more like this one called Marthe Henri. And the reason is things had to change when in the 1920s they found a cure for tuberculosis, a vaccine. And from that day forward, as you can imagine, the winter town started declining because why would people come here, maintain those big homes or rent them for their entourage? By then, everybody knew tuberculosis was highly contagious and there was no need for those big homes anymore. So after World War II, um, the neighborhood entered a slow decline. And eventually in the 60s, 70s, a lot of the homes were occupied, vandalized, as you can imagine. And like I said, they were saved just in time in the 1980s. And today when you come to Arcachon, you can visit about 
300, you can see, not visit, but you can see almost 300 of these homes. Look at this one across the street. It's massive. And one of its features that I like, because they all have something, is this incredible sunroom on the left here. So this one is probably a little too far to enjoy views of the basin of the water, but you can see that it's really pretty. And uh, somebody's looking at me. <laughs> She's like, why is she filming? <laughs> so when you come to Arcachon, I highly encourage you to go to the tourist office, which is next to the train station. It's a one hour train ride from Bordeaux. Easy to do in a day like I did three years ago between the French lockdowns when I came here and discovered it and decided I wanted to see more. Um, this is Beatrix, the villa I just showed you is named Beatrix. Most of these villas here were built between the 1880s and let's say World War I, the, the larger ones. After that, like I said, they became much smaller. So come here, pick up a map and explore those streets. Come up here, easy to climb. And uh, you can visit Arcachon and explore a lot of these homes. Those of you who have followed me for a while know how much I like the color orange. And there is an orange home here that I really like. So I'm going to cross the street and I'll wrap up in a few minutes. I'd like to thank you very much for following me on this stroll. There's a lot more to say about, of course, the winter town in Arcachon. And I hope you consider visiting it. Here is a lovely house. The name is right under the rooftop here. It says Les Pensées, which you could translate as thoughts or pansies, the flowers. So I'll let you imagine what they meant with this. This is Avenue Victor Hugo. It's a major street. There's quite a bit of traffic here, but it's lovely. Look at the trees leaning over it. And so what you need to do really is to step off the main streets around the park and go explore all these streets. The side streets, this is where you'll see a lot of the homes and the brochures will tell you who built them and why. The names have changed over time, over time and like I said, a lot of them have been restored, but they look magnificent. And it's incredible to think of what was built here by the Perrier brothers back in the 1860s that for many decades was a place where the European elites rush to and today it's just a peaceful residential neighborhood with of course a lot of historic historical value. Thank you for following me today on another virtual tour. Um, if you'd like to support France with Vero you know how to do it. The video notes will make that clear. For one-time donations I have a PayPal. My virtual tip jar is on PayPal but you can also decide to uh, support us on uh, join our fan community on Patreon, France with Vero, patreon.com slash France with Vero. This is where I share exclusive events with our fan community of Francophiles and well-traveled um, Francophiles. We have a private Facebook group and we do a lot. So consider joining us, but for today, this is it. I'm back on my vacation. Thank you for joining us. À bientôt.